pleasure to be here in this beautiful city and part of this prestigious proceeding. Uh, I'm going to talk about the future of intelligence, where we're going to enhance our natural biological intelligence, which we've been doing through education, through artificial intelligence. And first, I want to share a surprising discovery I made in 1981. I was trying to figure out how to time my inventions. And I started with the common wisdom that you cannot predict the future. But I thought if I uh, plotted a lot of data, being an engineer, visualized it in the right way, I could make some educated guesses. And I made a surprising discovery. There's one aspect of the future that's remarkably predictable. And that is that the price performance and capacity, not of everything and not of every technology, but of information technology, proceeds in a predictable manner. And I had the price performance of computing calculations per second per constant dollar from the 1890 American census through 1980. In 1981, it was a very smooth curve. And I projected it out to 2050. We're now 34 years later in 2015, and it's exactly where it should be. And that predictable trajectory is exponential, meaning every fixed period of time, it, it doubles. It's about every year. Uh, and, that, and even that speed is, is speeding up. And exponential growth is actually very different than our intuition. If you wonder why do we have a brain, it is to make predictions about the future. So we could predict the consequences of our actions, the consequences of inaction. But those built-in predictors are linear. You know, we track an animal in the field 10,000 years ago. We didn't expect it to speed up. We expected it to go a constant trajectory. That's a linear projection that worked very well. That became hardwired in our brains. The reality of information technology is, is progresses by doubling every period. So what's the difference? A linear projection, that's our intuition, goes one, two, three. An exponential projection, that's the reality of information technology, goes one, two, four. Doesn't sound that different, but by the time you get to step 30, the linear projection, our intuition, is at 30. The exponential projection is at a billion. At step 40, it's at a trillion. And this is not an idle speculation about the future. I mean, this little computer is actually several billion times more powerful per dollar than the computer I used when I went to MIT in the 1960s. And we're going to do that again the next 25 years. It'll be another several billion times more powerful. And it's also shrinking in size. This is 100,000 times smaller than that computer. Uh, in the 2030s, we'll have computers and little robotic devices the size of blood cells. So let me show you just what this means. Uh, an exponential starts out very slowly, and then it explodes when it gets to what I call the knee of the curve. Here's that graph I had in the 19, 1981. I had it through 1980. This goes through 2010. Uh, that's a very smooth exponential progression, actually doubly exponential. This is a logarithmic graph. As you go up the graph, we're multiplying by actually every level is 100,000 times greater than the level below it. So this goes back to the 1890 census. This is literally billions of times, actually a trillion times, uh, greater computation that we can get for the same cost since the 1890 census. Now people look at this and they go, oh, Moore's Law. But this started decades before Gordon Moore was even born. Moore's Law is just that part on the right having to do with chips. We were shrinking vacuum tubes in the 1950s to keep this going. Then that hit a wall. We couldn't shrink vacuum tubes anymore and keep the vacuum in 1959. So we went to the fourth paradigm. People have been talking about the end of Moore's Law, which will happen by 2020. Then we'll go to the sixth paradigm, which is three-dimensional computing. That's already begun. That'll be in full swing by 2020. That'll keep this going for a very long time. But really, what's the most interesting thing about this graph? Uh, the fact that it's trillions times more computation at the same cost is interesting. But more interesting is where is World War I, World War II, the, the Cold War, the Great Depression? Uh, it's, this goes through thick and thin, through war and peace, through boom times and recessions. People said, well, it must have slowed down during the recent recession. That's not the case. It has a mind of its own. I have a mathematical treatment of why this is the case in my book, Singularity is Near, but really the empirical evidence is the most convincing. And it's, so Moore's Law is really just one paradigm among many within computation. And computation is just one type of information technology. Uh, and I don't have time to dwell on all of this, but you could buy one transistor for a dollar in 1968. You can buy 10 billion for a dollar today. They're actually better because they're smaller, so the electrons have less distance to travel. 
So the, the, they've sped up. The cost of a transistor cycle has come down by half every year. That's a 50% deflation rate. So this is really an economic th thesis having to do with the economics of abundance, which is what information technology presents, versus the economics of scarcity, where we see inflation. And people say, OK, that has to do with these strange little devices that we carry around. But you know, that's just a very small part of the economy. But one industry, one area after another is going to be transformed from a, a non-information technology to becoming an information technology. The one that's undergoing that transformation right now is biology. Uh, the enabling factor for that was the Genome Project. That was a perfect exponential. Halfway through the project, we sequenced 1% of the genome. And mainstream critics said, I told you this wasn't going to work. Here you are, seven years, 1%. It's going to take 700 years, just like we said. That's linear thinking. My reaction at the time was, oh, we finished 1%. We're almost done, because 1% is only seven doublings from 100%. Indeed, it kept doubling. Seven years later, it was finished. That has continued since the end of the Genome Project. That first Genome cost a billion dollars. We're now down to a few thousand dollars per Genome. And it's not just sequencing. Our ability to understand this basically software, which is what it is, to model it, to simulate it, and to reprogram it, to change it, uh, to overcome disease and aging processes is also accelerating at an exponential pace. These technologies are now a thousand times more powerful than they were a decade ago when the Genome Project was completed. Now, people worry about deflation. We had massive deflation during the worldwide depression of the 1930s. There was a different reason, collapse of consumer confidence. But the concern is if I can get the same stuff, the same computation, the same communication, the same genetic sequencing that I could get a year ago for half the price, OK, I'll buy more. But am I going to double my consumption? Uh, after all, how much do I need? Aren't I going to saturate my ability to consume these resources? And if I don't double my consumption, uh, the size of the economy, not as measured in bits, bytes, and base pairs, but as measured in constant dollars or euros or uh, krona, uh, is going to shrink. For a variety of good reasons, that would be a bad thing. But that's actually not what we see. I mean, this is bits of memory shipped. We have dozens of graphs like this. We actually more than double our consumption. And we've been doing that in every form of information technology for the last 50 years. And the reason for that is innovation, creativity, basically what the Nobel Prize celebrates. Uh, when price performance reaches certain points, whole new applications explode. Uh, this is uh, communications, internet data traffic. That's the number of bits we move around wirelessly in the world. It was Morse code over AM radio a century ago. Now it's three, uh, 4G networks. Again, perfect exponential growth, uh, multiplied by a trillion in the last century. Uh, this is the graph I had of the internet in the early 80s. It was called the ARPANET. Uh, connected a few thousand scientists. I did the math and said, wow, this is going to be a World Wide Web connecting hundreds of millions of people in the late 1990s. And we'll need search engines because we won't be able to find anything. And the computational communication resources needed for a search engine will emerge. What I could not predict is that it would be these couple of kids in the Stanford dormitory who would take over the world of search among the 50 projects that were trying to do that. But the fact that we would need and, uh, search engines and that would be feasible was predictable. Uh, that's the same graph seen on a linear scale. That's how we experience it. So to the casual observer, it looked like, whoa, World Wide Web, new thing, came out of nowhere. But you could see it coming if you looked at the exponential progression. I mentioned biology. This is a whole revolution. Health and medicine used to be a linear process, hit or miss. Now we're actually treating uh, the software of life as software, as an information process. And so it's an information technology. And this is a grand transformation, which is generally overlooked when we look at the future of medicine. So supercomputers. Uh, on artificial intelligence, we need both the hardware and the software. There have been many different ways to estimate how much hardware capacity we need in order to functionally simulate the human brain. Hans Moravec did it one way. I've done it a couple of other ways. There's been other estimates. They all come out to 10 to the 14th calculations per second. We exceeded that. In 10 years ago, in supercomputers, uh, we're now vastly beyond that. Uh, a personal computer will achieve that level in the early 2020s. So th and again, this is a logarithmic scale, uh, perfect exponential growth in supercomputer capacity. Uh, this is a whole different 
area, but we're applying nanotechnology, which is a form of information technology, to the design of solar collection panels, also energy storage. The amount of uh, solar energy uh, is doubling every two years. Again, a perfect exponential. Right now, we're only six doublings from 100%, at which point we'll be using one part in 10,000 of the sunlight. And let me, well, three-dimensional printing, uh, physical things are going to be transformed too. I think that we're, we're kind of in the hype phase now of 3D printing. That's going to take off in the 2020s when we have submicron resolutions, but we ultimately will greatly expand our ability to create physical things as an information technology. And ultimately, computerized devices will be the size of blood cells. We'll, we'll put them in our bloodstream, they'll augment our immune system, they'll provide virtual reality from within the nervous system, and they'll also provide a direct connection from our brain to outside the brain, to the cloud. That sounds very futuristic. I'd point out that Parkinson's patients already have a neural uh, implant, a computer connected into their brain that connects outside the patient. They can download new software to this neural implant from outside the patient. So I've been thinking about thinking for 50 years and we have now effective models of how it works. The spatial resolution of non-invasive brain scanning is doubling every year. We have effective models now, functional models, of the neocortex, which is where we do our thinking. That's the outer layer of the brain. It emerged 200 million years ago with mammals. That's a picture of it right there on the top. And we don't have perfect knowledge, but we're gaining actually very useful information from the brain reverse engineering projects here in Europe and the United States that are giving us hints as to how the neocortex works. What, we're, what I'm doing in my group at Google is actually creating simulations, functional simulations of how we believe the neocortex works. Those will get more refined as we learn more and more about the brain. And I'll just give you a simple example. Uh, there, the basic function of uh, the neocortex, the basic unit, is not one neuron. We've made great advances, as you, as you may have heard, in deep neural nets, where we can now actually go multiple layers and get very abstract features. Just a few years ago, people's challenge was, well, AI can't even tell the difference between a dog and a cat. Now we can, and 10,000 other categories as well with these deep neural nets. But there, the chief unit that we're building on is a neuron. The real way the brain is organized is in modules of about 100 neurons, and each of these modules can uh, recognize a pattern and we were debating at uh, dinner last night ex as exactly which mathematical model fit that best, a hidden Markov model or a long, short temporal memory. I won't elaborate on that right now, but we're gaining more and more insight as to how these work. And they're organized in hierarchies. As we go up the hierarchy, we, get, we recognize even more and more abstract features. At the very highest level, about 15, 20 levels high, uh, we recognize things like, oh, that was funny, that was ironic, she's pretty. You might think that those are more sophisticated. It's actually the hierarchy below them that's more sophisticated. Uh, this 16-year-old girl was having brain surgery. She was talking to the surgeons. They wanted to talk to her. You can do that because there's no pain receptors in the brain. Whenever they stimulated these points shown in red, she would start to laugh, and they thought that they, was, they had found some kind of laugh reflex. But no, they had actually found the points in her neocortex that recognized humor. Whenever they stimulated these points, she would start to laugh. Uh, you guys are so funny just standing there, was a typical comment. Uh, and they weren't funny, not while doing brain surgery. But we're gaining more and more insight, uh, and this is helping us to build artificial intelligence. Ultimately, we will use artificial intelligence, first of all, to recognize language. Uh, the head of Watson is here, will tell you about his system. We're creating something similar at Google, which can actually understand language. Watson got this query correct in the rhyme category, a long, tiresome speech delivered by a frothy pie topping, and it quickly said, what is a meringue harangue? Which is pretty good, the humans didn't get that. It got a higher score than the best of humans combined, and it got its knowledge by reading Wikipedia. And we're doing something similar at Google. Ultimately, we will put AI in the cloud, we'll connect with these nanobots uh, to extra neocortex in the cloud, you know, if I want to, uh, this is very powerful, but if I want to do anything interesting like a search or language translation, it doesn't take place in this device. This can multiply itself thousands or millions fold by connecting wirelessly to the cloud. We ultimately will do that with these nanorobots in our brain. 
So if I'm walking along and I see somebody who says, oh, I better think of something clever. I've got two seconds. My 300 million neocortical modules isn't going to cut it. I need a billion or 10 billion for two seconds. I'll be able to access that wirelessly in the cloud, just the way these devices can access additional computation in the cloud. And so we'll become a hybrid of biological and non-biological thinking. And we'll apply that to solving the problems of humanity. We'll introduce some new problems along the way. We'll talk about promise and peril uh, a little bit later this morning. Thank you very much.